All right. Uh, hopefully we should have everybody on now. Um, good afternoon. My name is Luke Shabro. I'm Deputy Director for the Mad Scientist Initiative. Uh, really appreciate everyone joining us today. This event is part of our um, campaign looking at the weaponization of information. And we're kind of looking at this campaign throughout the summer. Um, and due to COVID-19 and not being able to have physical events, we've moved this to a virtual online campaign partner with our good friends at Georgetown University, the Center for Strategic Studies, um, who we partnered with historically in the past. So what we wanted to do was really explore this theme throughout the summer and, and this year in 2020 and figure out what is the weaponization of information, how can we identify it, how can we defeat it. Um, all these things have massive implications for the Department of Defense and for the larger uh, U.S. government. So in exploring that, uh, what we've done was a couple weeks ago, we first had Mr. Vincent O'Neill came on to talk about information disruption industry. Um, and that was a great event for us to kind of kick things off and get started. And then last week, we were honored to have uh, Pete Singer and August Cole, who were talking about their new book, uh, Burn In, a novel of the real robotic revolution. And they also talked about fictionalized intelligence um, and the weaponization of social media and all those things that really affect the day-to-day -day that we deal with. And so today, we're really honored to have from RAND Corporation, uh, we have Dr. Mark Bossard, uh, who's a sociologist at RAND Corporation focused on military organizations. Dr. Christopher Paul, who's a senior social scientist at RAND, they're going to be talking to us today about manufacturing reality with artificial intelligence. This is a fascinating topic. They put up an extremely good post on the RAND Corporation blog on this uh, that Mr. Ian Kersey will link to within the chat and you'll be able to link to from our blog. Um, so this is going to be an exciting chapter to what we're doing with weaponization of information. We're really excited to have everybody on. Uh, so without further ado and too much talking from me, uh, we'll turn it over to Dr. Kosar and Dr. Paul. Thanks, Luke. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you are to everyone. And we'll dig right into our, our presentation. Uh, this is something that we were, were asked to do or invited to submit for internal consideration at RAND, uh, taking some work and thinking we've done that's related to the, these topics and generalizing them and considering technology and artificial intelligence. And, and this is what we came up with. So since this is an Army audience, figure start out with a, a bottom line up front and point out some of the, the main takeaways that we hope you get from our discussion today. So, so first, humans have lots of vulnerabilities and it's relatively easy to get people to change their recollection or their expectations in sometimes kind of unreasonable ways by manipulating their environment and the information they receive and how it's presented. And second, gee, bad actors, hucksters, shysters, deceivers, tricksters have exploited these foibles throughout time. But third, new technology makes that easier and emerging technology is going to make that easier still. And then we'll conclude with some preliminary ideas. There's still a lot more work to be done in this area to think about how to help make us more resilient or just protect us in this emerging technology. So to kind of piggyback off of Chris's point, I think a crux of this write-up that we did was this idea that we all have human foibles. They're nothing new. And in fact, if you go back to the 1920s, you'll find old literature on what they call the Thomas theorem that if humans believe something's real, that can sometimes lead to them acting as if it's real in terms of its consequences. And, and the common day kind of concept of this is really this idea of gaslighting. So you can really change someone's perspective of the world to get them to behave in a certain way that they may not otherwise have behaved in otherwise. And I think the key here is that bad actors have started to operationalize this kind of gaslighting. So the examples that we draw on is the Soviet military developed reflexive control theory back in the 1960s, which in fact underpins much of the information efforts that you see today. Um, and the idea of reflexive control theory is that you can change situational features to get people to make decisions that might be suboptimal for them, but they don't necessarily know it's suboptimal. Another example is the East German Stasi. So they developed and institutionalized gaslighting in a program that they called decomposition to psychologically destroy the lives of their targets. 
And so they'd collect massive amounts of information and they'd break into people's homes and rearrange their furniture, send compromising photos to loved ones to in essence destroy the various domains of one's life. And this was, I think, one thing that we want to kind of emphasize here is that this was a very time intensive and costly effort. And the internet has actually made these same types of efforts very cheap and easy to do. Uh, so here is one of the slides that Mark spoke to uh, with this great image from Gaslight. And here is the other one he spoke to, talking about the Stasi and the decomposition. And now I'm going to follow up on that by talking a bit about some of the other vulnerabilities that we as humans face. So we've done some previous work, uh, my colleague Miriam Matthews and I, on the Russian firehose of falsehood propaganda model, which looks at why we as humans might be vulnerable to falsehood-based propaganda when most of us were raised with a, a influence and persuasion paradigm that said credibility is king and the truth will always win. Well, fellow humans, it's, it's, it's not always like that. Uh, our human story brains based on cavemen sitting around a fire together and being able to look people in the eye and make judgments based on our experiences and people that we know personally. Uh, we haven't evolved much since then, but boy, the information environment has changed. And just several key points from that. First, quantity has a quality all its own. The more channels, the more individuals, the more sources you get similar arguments from that's more persuasive, even if individually you look at any one of those sources and you wouldn't give it a whole lot of weight, uh, when it all adds up, it all adds up. Repetition, familiarity, the fire hose, the fire hose works. And, and related to that, uh, the, all the communication and persuasion studies have one really strong conclusion, and that is the most persuasive source for communication is someone like you. And I put the air quotes on that because it's someone you perceive as being like you, whether they're really like you or not, whether there's lots of different dimensions of, of likeness that could be mobilized. Say you see someone on an internet forum and their avatar icon is the logo for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Well, hey, I lived in Pittsburgh for 20 years. I'm a big Steelers fan. They're a Steelers fan. They must be like me. Or maybe their avatar is someone looks a little bit like me or someone of my, my cultural heritage, or maybe they use some, some idiom in their communications that makes me think I like, I'm like them, or they say something about themselves that is also true about me. There's lots of different ways that I could perceive someone as like me as part of my group and not part of the other. And there's lots of ways that someone could mislead me about whether or not they are like me. But if I decide they're like me, then the things they say have undue weight. In, in my human story brain. Another big point, the, everybody, everybody knows that first impressions are really important, but it's really easy to underestimate the strength of this first mover advantage. And some of that has to do with how we as humans store information. When I am presented with a factoid, and that's the word I'll use for something that is presented as fact, but may or may not be, I make a snap adjudication, I say, mm, I accept that factoid. And then I don't take that factoid and go to my mental Rolodex or filing cabinet and open up a drawer and store it carefully on a single card. I kind of build it into my worldview. So if someone comes along later and tells me that that factoid is false, they're not asking me to do the mental equivalent of go to a filing cabinet, find a single card and destroy it. They're attacking my worldview. And it's not impossible, but that's a much higher bar. So being first really is hugely important. And boy, it's a lot easier to be first with something when you made it up. So falsehoods kind of have an advantage as first movers. And then we as humans are poor at discerning truth from falsehood. When we really try, we can be not bad at it. But most of the time, we're kind of cognitively lazy. Uh, what Daniel Kahneman describes as thinking fast and thinking slow. Most of the time we're thinking fast. We're using shortcuts, we're using peripheral cues. We're just not fully engaging our brain. I'll give you an example of peripheral cues. Imagine 
you're on the internet browsing videos, you see a video that has a running footer at the bottom of the screen that's scrolling information. There's a logo up in one corner that says news of some kind. There's a sound stage. There's an attractive, well-spoken anchor person. You see that, your brain says news. And provided that that well-spoken anchor person doesn't say something that's totally contradictory to your existing beliefs, you're probably going to accord it a certain level of credibility, whether you should or not. Oh, I have the slides now, so I can't just wait for Mark to advance them. That was backwards. So the internet further capitalizes on these human vulnerabilities in ways that I've kind of already hinted at. Hey, on the internet, you don't have to be who you say you are. Just because somebody has the Steelers logo as their avatar does not mean that they are actually a Steelers fan. Uh, just because someone says they are a U.S. citizen living in Detroit doesn't mean that they aren't, in fact, a Russian citizen living in the suburbs of St. Petersburg. Uh, and the internet makes it easier to have lots of fake people. Just because there's one person sitting in a basement somewhere doesn't mean they can't be pretending to be dozens of people. And gee, on the internet, you can say whatever you want, whether or not it is true. Uh, and we don't have that sitting around the campfire ability to look someone on the internet in the eye and make what limited ability to discern truth we have effective. And gee, yeah, you can be anywhere at any time, up in the middle of the night, talking to someone somewhere else on a host of different channels with a host of different personas. So it's, it's the internet has made it even easier for the long tradition of, of hucksters and shysters to find and prey on further victims. Uh, consider, for example, the continued propagation of various forms of Nigerian prince banking scams and how to this day there are still unfortunates who aren't aware that that's a scam and continue to email their banking information. I think the ease by which all the things that Chris talked about is really what the one of the things that the internet provides. So the internet in essence has reduced the transaction costs to exploit others. Um, it is easy to spot targets and assess these targets. It's easy to collect data on them, plan operations and execute. In the past, if you look at the attempts by state apparatuses to actually do this, it took a tremendous amount of time and effort and resources. The internet has basically flattened that. In essence, uh, it's scaled gaslighting. Gaslighting's for anyone. It, anyone can be an internet troll today. And so what we've done here is we've kind of sketched out some new emerging technologies that one, um, that one could potentially use to easily um, basically conduct the similar types of operations that we've seen in the past um, today via the internet. And three of those are the use of inauthentic but realistic looking personas, uh, using artificial intelligence for scale and experimentation on potential targets, and then general ad generative adversarial networks and natural language, pro language processing. If we go to the next slide. Artificial intelligence, I think, is, is, is perhaps the area that is this like amorphous term, but it really does have implications depending on how you look at it. Each of us are creating millions and millions of data points each day. And those data points are being used to sell us stuff. But a bad actor can easily use those same types of means for other types of ends. And we argue that artificial intelligence has become increasingly easy for bad actors to leverage. And it's not just in terms of figuring out potential targets, in terms of spotting and assessing those targets, but it's also in terms of feeding information on how you can best figure out how to manipulate and change the reality and perceptions of a potential target. And what I think is perhaps most um, concerning is that you don't need the manpower anymore to conduct these types of operations that we've seen in the past. We can use social bots and artificial intelligence to experiment on potential targets. We do not need 90,000, 90 plus thousand uh, employees of the East German Ministry of State Security anymore. We don't need 170 plus thousand uh, uh, informants from East Germany anymore. 
We can really do it with a very shoestring budget and a small, num small number of individuals that can basically program these various types of bots to start testing out what messages work on a highly individualized scale based on the data that you and I are creating that any of us could potentially buy in the marketplace or potentially acquire um, in, 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 um, in the dark web. So thinking a bit more about this technology, and I apologize because I'm not an AI specialist, but, but my understanding about how generative adversarial networks work is it's, it's pitting two neural networks against each other uh, and letting them play an iterative game. So one of the, the neural networks is the generator and the other is discriminator. And the generator gets some training data and says, okay, I'm going to make a bunch of content that looks like this training content. And the discriminator gets the same or similar training data and says, okay, I'm going to learn what's, what's real and what's fake. And then they keep trying. They, they, they learn against each other over and over and over and over again. And it doesn't ultimately matter who wins. They both get better and better at learning to make something that is hard to detect versus learning to detect something. Uh, so that's, that's my, my poor layman's understanding of how GANs work. But what's important about this, whether I've got the details exactly right or not, that, and I, and I think I'm pretty close, at least at that hand-waving level, uh, imagine that you take this same kind of logic of experimenting, trying out, making something fake and or persuasive, and then instead of playing against another neural network, playing against real people. So that's what we're talking about in this reduced economy of scale. Imagine someone setting up a whole bunch of bot personas, but rather than them being sock puppet bots or bots that are, are controlled by a, directly by a, a puppet master, they're controlled by some kind of AI that has a whole bunch of different neural network leveraged and determined persuasive messages and it sends them out to different groups of humans who it has a lot of baseline information about because of big data and marketing buys and loose data that are that are publicly available but maybe some of which shouldn't be and kind of sloppy privacy settings and that that whole set of things so it knows something about these individuals it, it sends them persuasive messages or has persuasive interactions with them on various engagement platforms and it gets responses. Sometimes it gets no response and maybe it learns that, oh, when I get no response, that probably means I've been detected and I'm being ignored. But sometimes it might get quite a visceral response and it can learn from that too. And by doing this over and over again, primed with a little training data from from the experts, the, the kind of people who used to work for the Stasi and figured out all these mean things to do to people to, to break down their world, or uh, people who have some idea about how to, to nudge people in certain directions or to rile people up. Starting with those things and given some human direction and some human training, learning on the job, as it were, and going through and trying to do whatever their evil puppet masters want them to do to get people to react or behave in certain ways. And Chris and I, when we wrote this up, we, we started really thinking through the implications of how cheap it is to do the things that, for example, Chris just talked about. And right now this technology has a lot of promise, particularly with advertising, right? We can, the things that are trying to sell you and I cars and skincare ads can help expand our economy and give us choice, but there's also a darker side to it. And it's only a matter of time and we're already seeing it where the same technologies that are commonplace in the market will suddenly kind of transition over into some of these either state-based actors or other types of actors who can kind of co-opt it for their own means. Um, the one thing that we argue is that defending against these scalable types of manipulations is pretty tricky in today's social media environment. Um, we do have First Amendment rights. We have the right of freedom of speech. And it's pretty difficult right now to determine 
who actually is or is not a real person that is exercising that right. And we started to sketch out some defensive strategies. This is not the gospel of how we solve this problem, but it kind of gives us some initial starting points of where there might be options available from a policy perspective to address this. These range from looking at ta our current tax code for how we tax social media companies. One area that I'm particularly interested in is looking at reporting requirements for the Securities and Exchange, Exchange Commission. So you look at a company like Facebook, 95 or so, my estimate, 95 or so percent of their revenues coming from advertising. Presumably advertisers are paying to advertise to real people. They have monthly active users. The question is, how do you calculate that? And is that estimate actually auditable? And I know in the past, the SEC has looked at trying to standardize reporting in their quarterly and, and yearly reporting for these publicly traded companies. Um, another issue that's come up more recently is uh, Section 230 of the uh, 1996 uh, Communications Decency Act and the idea of expanding civil liability for social media companies for what users are posting. I mean, in the end of the day, I think one big issue is identity verification. If you go on a web, if you go on Airbnb, you can, it will require you to upload a uh, ID, like a state ID of sorts. And the question is, how do we kind of incentivize companies to ensure that people who are, who are posting content are who they claim to be? Because this issue is only going to get, potentially going to get worse because it's easy to do, it's cost effective. And going back to Chris's original point about this fire hose of falsehood, how do we start trying to reduce the amount of uh, falsehoods coming out of this hose? Um, that's all I have on my end. I don't know if Chris has any other things to add about the implications. Yeah, I'll just, uh, on that identity verification issue, it's certainly something that if social media companies were incentivized rather than disincentivized, because right now the current structure disincentivizes social media companies to enforce a one user, one account policy because they like the inflated numbers from having multiple accounts or huge numbers of, of fake accounts because it, it affects their ad revenue. So if the incentives were flipped around such that there were incentives for them to reduce the number of, of false personas, we recognize that that still could potentially be two edged here in our robust and reasonably healthy democracy, having one user, one account and verified identities is a good thing, but in totalitarian societies or in emerging, but not quite there yet democracies, anonymity is a good thing. So we recognize that, that there's some nuance and complexity here, but in terms of, of protecting Americans from being manipulated by, foreign actors and other forms of bad actors, uh, that might be a nice thing. So I think that's the end of our formal remarks. Uh, so I think now I'll stop sharing and hand things back over to Luke for moderated questions. All right, fantastic. I mean, this, this has been a great presentation. You can tell in the chat, a lot of people have a lot of questions and comments. So um, we, we've got some questions coming in. So let, let me go ahead and get started with the first question. So we have, um, and we're gonna answer these questions through the Q&A function. Um, so if you have a question and you've asked it in the chat, but you haven't put in the Q&A function, make sure you please put it in there. Um, I am going to first go with, uh, because I like earning brownie points. I'm going to go with my boss, Director Lee Grubbs, had a question about uh, with speed and quantity being stacked against our decision-making processes or, you know, the OODA loop as well, how do we improve cognitive thinking and use human-machine teaming to mitigate that? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. And so the, the human-machine teaming is certainly something that could help because the human side of it, there are just limits. Coming back to Daniel Kahneman and thinking fast and thinking slow, we as humans can only think slow and carefully and thoughtfully so much of the time. And that's exacerbated by uh, a data flood kind of environment where we're constantly bombarded with input. So the, the limits of what the humans can do by themselves are concerning. What about a little help? There are lots of different imaginable flavors of human machine teaming. One of the things that, that I'd like to see is, is more work to bring those kinds of capabilities in on the social media platform side. 
wouldn't it be great if when some piece of news was deemed as questionable, there was some kind of marking that indicated that that was questionable. And that if you wanted to share it on, you could, not interfering with your First Amendment rights, but that you'd have to positively confirm that something little, something would pop up and say, multiple fact-checking sources have found this this piece of information to be questionable. Do you still wish to share it with your friend, network, whatever? And you have to positively click, yes, I do. I want to propagate baloney. Fine, that's your right. Go ahead. Uh, but some some kind of help, something to kick you into thinking slow for a minute, make you stop and think, oh, oh, I didn't realize. You know, it seemed consistent with my worldview. It looked like it looked like it was probably an actual news story. But you're telling me that multiple fact fact check sources have disputed this. Well, maybe I want to look into it a little more. Maybe I want to think about it. Or, or maybe I'm not feeling like being thoughtful and I just want to send it on. Uh, so that's kind of a basic could do now human machine teaming, but there's certainly more possibility there. Mark, you have any thoughts on that? You know, Reddit's an interesting example because Reddit has these communities where they really have bottom-up kind of monitoring where they have volunteer users who are kind of monitoring the various types of forums, but they also have bots that will flag information that is either not relevant or is inflammatory. And I think when you start looking at how you develop these kinds of systems where you do have dedicated individuals who are in some degree are creating a hierarchy that can kind of sift through this stuff, but they're also relying on machines as well. I think that might be a potential useful area to explore. But again, I think it comes, you know, the question is how much of a command control based kind of approach do you want? How much of it is a bottom up approach? And I think you look at things like Wikipedia, but also Reddit, where you have machines and people working together to kind of clean up these information spaces. There might be some interesting kind of case studies there that one could draw from. Okay, as a Reddit uh, junkie, I will go ahead and um, endorse that idea. Um, <laughs> but the um, uh, another question we have from Dr. Avramov, I apologize if I, I butcher that, from UT Austin. Uh, the question was, um, you've talked previously before, uh, Dr. Posar, about reflexive control theory. Um, what, what are some examples, as we've talked about the subject today, um, that we kind of see in information warfare in real life, what are some maybe examples that you've seen uh, as related to what we're talking about today? So, so that's a really great question because it's a really rich, solid theory building, kind of theory construction, right? If you look at it, actually a colleague of mine who's an economist at RAND who actually went through the mathematics of it and, and it's, it, there's interesting parallels to how we kind of interpret it versus game theory. I, I, I want to be very clear. I don't think reflexive control theory, the mathematics and the, the, the theoretical program itself is directly informing these kinds of efforts where there's a bunch of equations that were that the Russians or whoever else are calculating out. This is what kind of campaign we're going to run today versus tomorrow. But I do think the underlying kind of theory is driving kind of the approach. Now, how do I kind of know this? Because um, one of the authors you mentioned, I actually emailed him last year before he passed away. And I asked him straight out, do you think the Russians are using your theoretical research program. And he confirmed that in his belief, this is, this is, the, this is, this is what he believes that they're doing it. So my suspicion is, is that the spirit of the program, the overarching kind of big picture theorems are driving it, but I don't think the actual specific mechanics of it in terms of the calculations are necessarily kind of informing today's kind of information efforts, um, particularly those online. Hey, but Mark, you have that, that example, right? Was it the, the storming the courthouse example? Hmm. I don't recall. Uh, all right. Well, I'll, if, if you don't have it to hand, I'll, I'll butcher it. But we have uh, a documented example where there were some dissidents in uh, a government building in Russia, and uh, the authorities leaked that the dissidents had taken over the radio station so that they could then use the radio station to broadcast some false information from the dissidents to be provocative so that they could then get uh, a lot more people's accord with storming the government building and in taking control of it and inflicting some casualties on the dissidents. And it was, it was very much, and I'm sure they didn't get out their calculators and, and do reflexive control algorithmic calculations, but it was very much thinking about what do we want 
whom to do, what kinds of things, especially underhanded things, can we do to get them to do that and, and working through it and, and fairly effective. And, and you can see that kind of thinking in a lot of other contexts, but there was one concrete example, and I apologize, I can't put my finger on the exact location, the date, or I may have some of the details wrong, but if you, if you reach out to one of us, we can, we can pull that for you. Having said that, does that, does that remind you, Mark, of the details at all? Yeah, I remember now, I mean, yeah, that, yep. Okay. No, that's a fantastic answer, and I, I really appreciate that. So moving on to another question, I actually want to clue a couple together because we have a lot of questions in the Q&A, um, and I think these are really fantastic. Um, so uh, uh, a, a question from uh, Ryan Namura, uh, again, apologies for pronunciations. Um, what can we do essentially um, in terms of early education and prioritizing critical thinking in that um, in order to kind of defeat what, what's going on, what you two have really described here. And then the second part of that um, is actually Tony in the chat has said um, beyond that, beyond part of, you know, the early education, what else can we do? Is this a solvable problem? Is it intractable? And is this really just endemic now and part of everyday life and part of modern warfare? Wow, we're really good questions. Uh, I'm an optimist in most respects. So even though I tend in these kind of talks to give a lot of doom and gloom information, I hope that we can get towards better. I don't know that this is a completely solvable problem because there's this, this two-sided arms race kind of component to it. So we didn't talk about deep fakes, but we could have. This is another... AI-driven way to contribute to falsehoods or manage personas. And with, with deep fakes, you could actually have a video chat in the future with someone who looks and sounds real, or worse, looks and sounds like someone other than who it is and is able to engage with you. Uh, but so far, in contests, in, in AI contests between the deep fakes and the discriminators, things have favored the discriminators. But as tricks emerge on the discriminator side to catch the deep fakes, like early deep fakes didn't blink, then the folks providing training information to the AIs running the deep fakes got onto that. So there's this constant arms race kind of thing. So there's the question is, can we make it expensive enough to be part of that arms race? And can we protect ourselves enough to function? And I hope that we can. So coming back to the, the first part of the question about early education and critical thinking. I think media literacy education is great and it absolutely can't hurt. And there's a thinness uh, in existing research about showing how effective it actually is. It, it doesn't hurt, but it isn't, it isn't the solution. We're still sitting around the campfire cavemen humans and we have a lot of weaknesses and vulnerabilities. Being trained about thinking slow more of the time and watching for different cues to push us to think slow and really engage and be critical thinkers more of the time will help, but by itself, not a solution. I, I think Chris is right. It's a multifaceted approach. And, you know, it's like the old Mark Twain saying, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it tends to rhyme. This ain't the first time we've been scared, scared about media effects. Um, there's kind of these like two streams of research. One is this idea of um, the magic bullet theory that we're all just sponges just soaking up information. We get duped all the time and we have no agency. You saw these concerns when radio came onto the, became popularized, popularized television became popularized um, and now the internet. Um, but there's another kind of way to think about it that there's much more research that supports this. It's this idea that we're active media consumers. And so I think the idea then is like, how do we train people to be better active media consumers? And also how do we make sure that we can kind of manage all this information in a way so when people are seeking out information that supports their beliefs, that they're seeking out information that is potentially gonna be much more, more balanced and more constructive. And I think there's a lot of technology that's being developed that can help that, but it's not gonna be a silver bullet where one thing is gonna magically like solve this problem. I think it's like anything else, we're evolving and there'll be lots of different technologies that either can deprioritize content that might be potentially harmful, uh, flagging content that people might be consuming that might 
contain a certain threshold of falsehoods, but then finally also the media literacy components. So as Chris was just saying, it's a multifaceted approach, and I think figuring out how all those pieces go together is the big challenge that we have right now. I, I think that's a really interesting um, input in terms of how, how do we think about that. Um, I want to I want to put together a few. Again, we have great questions, and I want to kind of put some together um, from Jason Thomas and Dr. Admirov again. Um, and I'm I'm going to kind of um, spin it into uh, a multi-part question here. Um, what do we do in terms of um, if we use AI, if we use these bots that we're thinking about in terms of defense against this? What do we do when these data sets are corrupted? Um, or if they're uh, purposefully um, manipulated, or if there's a, a purposeful bias in place in there. And then I think that kind of relates, to, you know, segues into uh, one of Dr. Abramov's questions, which is what offline measures can we take in terms of not just using the machine, but what, what can we do for humans? I know we've talked already about those early education sets um, and, and prioritizations, but what can we do in terms of uh, cognitively? I mean, I, I would just say that I think narratives are really important. And this is something I know that we kind of figured out when the Soviets had their active measures programs in the 70s and 80s, is that trying to just counter one piece of information and play whack-a-mole doesn't really work very well. It's really a systems level approach. So unit of analysis is really kind of the system. And so one thing that they discovered in the 80s at least was calling out the larger effort, not the specific kind of piece of information. That, that's not as great. It's just playing whack-a-mole. And I do think a systems level approach is really going to probably be our best bet. And that goes back to our original kind of the last set of questions was that there's lots of different multifaceted approaches to dealing with this. The question is putting it all together. And I do looking at the Russians, the Chinese, what other, whatever adversary that we're focused on that might potentially be involved in these types of efforts at, in the US or in our allies abroad, understanding why they're doing it and being able to communicate what's going on besides just that this is a false piece of information, but tying that to a larger strategic objective and making sure you communicate that so people understand like the bigger picture here. A couple of thoughts. Uh, so the first part of the question about what happens when the, the foundational data are corrupted, again, not an AI expert, but I think that is a, a danger, a big danger in the, the machine assisted decision space because of, of two factors. One, uh, bad training data results in bad outcomes. And currently machine learning based decisions don't have a, an explainable logic. It's just black box you get when you when you let machine learning does something do something it it knows how to do what it does and it gives you an answer with a certain probability or confidence of success but it doesn't tell you why and it it can't evaluate the underlying assumptions maybe somebody's working on that somebody who's smarter about ai but i think that you have you have picked out a serious challenge if you get bad training data you're going to get a bad answer, but you're not necessarily going to know that. And I think that black box aspect of it is one of the big barriers to human decision makers being comfortable with the machine support. If you're the commander and you've got this battle space decision support tool and it, it tells you something, you know, if one of your subordinates told you that, you'd say why? And they might just have to say one or two words that would totally tie into your human heuristics and make sense to you. You'd be like, oh, got it. That makes perfect sense. I'm moving out. But when the when the AI says it, you're like, hmm, that's counter to my intuition. But gee, mathematically, you're right more often than I am. But why? It's like, because. Because that's the answer. That's not very satisfying as a human. Uh, coming back to the other half of the question about what kinds of offline measures we can take. I'm, I'm with Mark on holistic solutions, combining lots of different aspects, thinking about not just what we do in terms of promoting human resilience, but what we do in terms of, of trying to put kinks in the fire hose, trying to get after the bad actors and diminish their opportunities by changing the social media landscape and the other things about the environment or uh, 
putting sanctions of various flavors on them, not, not necessarily just financial sanctions, but, but bad consequences for bad behavior. Uh, similarly, coming back to the first mover advantage, uh, I know, and I've talked to a bunch of folks, State Department, other folks in public affairs, we have this obligation where our spokespersons, when someone says something that isn't true, we have to stand up and, and refute it. You get up behind a podium and you say at such and such a time, such and such a falsehood was stated, here's what actually happened. That has all, and the, the, the studies show that has almost no effect at all. But it's a responsibility, it's an obligation, it's, what's, it's what spokespeople do. So when I, when I give advice to these people, I say, gee, uh, you have to do what you have to do. But in that communication, in that utterance, spend as little time on the retraction or the refutation as possible and as much time turning it into a forewarning about the next one. So make the compulsory obligation, hey, so-and-so said this untrue thing, here's what actually happened. And this particular actor on this particular channel is likely in the future to say these kinds of lies. You know, turn it around, uh, make, it, make it a forewarning, recapture the initiative and the first mover advantage for yourself. I would also just add that, you know, we're, it's a very US centric kind of approach because we're, we have internet access is very, most people have internet access. A lot of people have social media accounts. There's a lot of countries in the world where there, there's a lag. They might be five or 10 years behind us. And so when we think about exactly the things that Chris was just talking about, we shouldn't just restrict ourselves to social media companies. I think, I think where are there places where other types of mediums are starting to develop in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, because we're not the only place in the world where this is happening. We could potentially weaponize this ourselves against our adversaries. But we also have proxies in other parts of the world where our adversaries and ourselves are going to be involved and figuring out not only just what's going on in social media, but what's potentially going on in other types of mediums, let it be television or radio in certain parts of the world where that's still kind of the predominant way people are consuming information, I think is going to be critical. Those were uh, absolutely excellent answers. And um, I'm going to shift to another question and uh, Mark, I apologize for mi mispronouncing your name. It might be Mark Tocher. Um, but Mark gets this question because uh, he appealed to my love of Malcolm Gladwell. Um, and he talked about, Gladwell talks about in um, the book Talking to Strangers um, that we kind of, we have to default to truth. Um, it's what helps us function in our everyday lives in terms of trusting that someone's not lying to you, that they're serving you food that's not poisoned. Um, and we, we don't have time or ability uh, to, or capacity to really, you know, test and, and, and question every one of these things. So we live in this default to truth. And, and with both of you being sociologists, what kind of societal effects happen if, especially at least, at least with just our online interactions, if we have a default now from truth to a default to mistrust because we're just so overwhelmed. You know, you talked about the fire hose of dis disinformation. What, what kind of societal effects does that have on us? Um, and asking from the, the military vantage point, what do you think effect this, that kind of has on DOD as well? Chris, do you want to go or do you want me to go first? Uh, no, I can, I can start. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly one of the things that Russia wants is to, and that's, that's the slogan of RT, right? Question more. Russia, one of their, their many objectives, but one of the ones that's easier to discern is a war on information. They have propagandized their own domestic audience for so long that Russians don't believe media sources, especially state-run media sources. And that's, that's a real barrier to, to effective influence inside of Russia. They want that for the rest of the world. They want the rest of the world to be skeptical and for the default to be uncertain because it makes it easier for them to misbehave and pretend they're not misbehaving because it makes it harder for... Western governments to com convince their democratic citizens that some crisis is happening and requires a certain response. Uh, so that's, that's, that's something that they're pushing us towards. So this is a real concern. I haven't spent a whole lot of time thinking about the broader implications of what that, what it, what it means if they're successful. 
So maybe while I've been talking, Mark's been thinking and, or he has some earlier thought to rely on to share. Well, I have to say, this is probably the only time that my dissertation has actually been somewhat related to my work at RAND. Um, when you look at like societal trust, there's interpersonal trust that you know someone, I know Chris, Chris knows me, I trust Chris, and so we have a good working relationship. But there's also this, this idea of assurance structures that you kind of just trust the structures themselves. So when I meet someone from the army, I trust that that person is a good faith individual who is a soldier in the US Army because I trust the US Army. I have assurance because that person's a member of the Army, I can trust them. And going back to Chris's point about this fire hose of falsehood, it really is designed to create almost a collective exhaustion to the point where you don't really have trust in these assurance structures that we're all tied to. You don't have trust in the news media, the government, the presidency, DOD, or at a minimum, even if you maybe don't know if you trust them or distrust them, there's just this exhaustion where it's not worth it anymore to take the mental calculation to figure out truth from fact or truth from falsehood. And so I think that's kind of the biggest risk that I see is that these assurance structures that we've spent hundreds of years developing that really kind of guide the patterns of the vicissitudes of our life. What happens when we're so exhausted and we're so distrustful that they slowly erode. And I think that's gonna be a concern. And that's a concern for DOD, it's a concern for our personnel inside of, inside of DOD, because command and control is built on trust in this assurance structure. It's also a concern when we look at our partner countries and ensuring that we have that level of institutional trust and that the individuals in these institutions can trust that these institutions are gonna function correctly. Um, and I think that's kind of the biggest risk from my perspective. I think I think that's excellent in terms of um, really helps us think about uh, assurance structures is something that we have to think about um, even within mad scientists. I think you make such a good point there, Dr. Pissard, on terms of uh, command and control. And that's such a huge part of what we think about and how you trust those things. And it's not necessarily um, just human trust either. It's this idea of uh, trusting kind of what we talked about before in terms of data sets and what does that mean? Because you have to trust the training data that um, is actually training the, the AI machine learning. Um, and then you have to trust the input and the feedback and everything else. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of trust that comes into play there. And that was, a, that was an excellent answer. I do apologize. We have um, probably at least 10 questions that might not get answered um, at this time, but that just shows the level of interest that's been here. Uh, and we'll make sure we have some follow on. So last question before we kind of close everything out, uh, I'm going to combine two, but I thought these are really excellent questions as it relates to um, realism in terms of what we have to deal with in our everyday lives. So Corey Phillips asks, um, is there an easy to understand kind of resource out there that we can pass um, to kind of uh, family and friends um, on how to identify these things. So they might not be um, necessarily in this subject matter expertise and maybe they're not going to RAND Corporation and, and the Mad Scientist blog that often, although all your family should subscribe to the Mad Scientist blog. Um, but if they're not, you know, is, is there easy to understand resources out there? And then as a follow on, uh, Andrew Arts asked a great question about um, how can we help service members and families um, in terms of in terms of helping protect them because we've talked a lot about mad scientists about personalized warfare in the future um, and we know for a fact that it's already happening in terms of dependents and, and military associations um, being targeted but it's only going to be stepped up in the next level of personalized warfare so any any um, possible point to resources on either of those yeah that's that's, those are great questions. And, and I think we definitely need to do more to protect families. I think that's, that's got to become a segment in whatever pre-deployment advice or training families get uh, that, hey, there are these new kinds of vulnerabilities in the world. There are these new things that can happen. And here's who to call if you think it's happening to you. So that rather than you panicking and you, you conveying that panic to your soldier forward, that there's someone someone conus that you can reach out to and say, Hey, I got this, I got this message. It looks real. I'm freaking out. How do we verify it so that I, 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 I know whether I need to do something or I, I know what's really happening and to, to put some structures in place. And I, I think that's, uh, 
that's certainly doable. But having some good videos, some good training modules from showing what's possible uh, to get people just aware of the possibility that, hey, just because just you get an email saying that your bank account is overdrawn doesn't necessarily mean that it's so. Just because you get an, someone forwards you or posts on Facebook some kind of news report that suggests heavy casualties in your wife or husband's unit forward doesn't necessarily mean that it's so. Uh, now, turning back to, to general resources kind of to, to share with friends and family, uh, I've seen a couple of things that, that I think are pretty good. There's a, there's a thing called the debunking guide, which is a, a pretty good tool for talking and thinking about how things, what kinds of things can be false and, and it's pretty readable and accessible. Uh, and, then, and then, pardon my language, but this is the name of it. There's some guys that have put together an, an online class that's, that's about detecting and resisting bullshit. And so if you, if you Google the bullshit class, you'll find that and you can, it's free, you can watch it, you can watch pieces of it. And so that's, that's nice, accessible video lectures. And then in a little you know, horn tooting, I would encourage people to forward around this, this short three page commentary that, that Mark and I wrote uh, and the the Russian firehose of falsehood propaganda model piece that Miriam Matthews and I did. It's only about 15 pages. It is a little bit academic, but uh, compared to normal academic and RAND style stuff, it's, it's pretty darn accessible. Uh, there's also a neat single page slide of different types of disinformation. And I can't remember. It's it's something media. I can't remember. I know if I, if I were, instead of looking at you, if I were on the Google, I could probably find it. Uh, and, and I'll, I'll, before I, I allow Mark to have his closing thoughts, I'll point out that many of you have other questions. Uh, our, our email is available. We'd be happy to answer your questions or engage offline. Mark. So I'm going to plug it again, Chris. The Firehose of Falsehood, I think, is one of the most popular pieces, I think, on, from what I've heard on the RAND website. And so I, it's an excellent, like, overview. I think it really crystallizes what was happening well before people were actually talking about this in mass. Um, an organization in D.C. called IREX has campaigns that they've developed. You can look online. One of them is Wash Your News. It's an interesting kind of campaign, and they have, like, tidbits and insights. Um, to return to the military families question, because I study military families, that's the other thing I do here and at RAND. And the thing with military families is that they're, they're a vulnerable population. They skew young, they marry young, uh, they form families young. They tend to be in, particularly in the enlisted class, in a when they were junior, in the junior ranks, a precarious financial situation. And they're just in, in the course of their life, they're in a precarious family situation because they're, they're maturing still, particularly when you're in your early 20s. And if you notice a lot of these information efforts target vulnerable populations um, and they try to identify where there's these kind of schisms and this tribalism to exploit that. And so when it look, you look at military families, it's a very unique subset that faces very unique types of vulnerabilities and they are ripe for exploitation. And I think that we need to protect our service members and our soldiers, but we also have to protect the spouses and the children because um, they are, there's a lot of opportunities to exploit an already vulnerable population that is trying to navigate life and navigate this unique, uh, greedy institution that is the United States Army. And I think that, as Chris said, there needs to be more kind of concerted effort to figure out how to defend the service members, but also the families. Thank you both for the excellent questions. And don't worry, we will be collecting those resources from you because I'm sure uh, we're going to want to post it on Mad Scientist as people are going to ask. Um, really, really want to thank you both. What an excellent job and really appreciate you coming on. The presentation was great. The chat was great. Um, I really think that the, the, the Q&A just helped so much. Um, this has been some fantastic discourse, exactly uh, what we've been looking for with the weaponization information. Um, do you want to tell everybody where they can follow your work at? Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if you, if you guys are on Twitter or if you just want to uh, put out your emails or anything like that. 
Yeah, so I'm I'm not on social media for reasons that I'd be happy to discuss discuss offline, but it's it's C Paul, my first initial and my last name ran together at rand.org, O R G, because we're a nonprofit. Uh, and to find my stuff, if you just Google Christopher Paul Rand, all three words, you'll get right to me. If you if you use just Chris Paul, you'll get that basketball player do, guy. If you if you do Rand Paul, you'll get someone entirely different. But Christopher Paul Rand, those three words go to me. Um, similarly, you can you can email me at m p o s a r d at rand dot org. Um, I'm on the Rand website, uh, so if you just Google my name, M A R E K Posard Rand, you'll probably find it. Um, and I'm on Twitter, but very few people follow me because I don't really have a whole lot to say. So um, it's not super eventful, but it's M N as a Nathan Posard is my handle. So um, you can be one of the probably like 50 people who follow me. <laughs> those are those will be the best followers. Uh, I really appreciate again both of you. Uh, what we want to do is encourage everybody to make sure that you're continuing to follow along with our weaponization information campaign. Um, the two presentations that I discussed previously, uh, we actually had the videos of those online. So if you go to our APAN or all purpose, uh, uh, excuse me, all partners access network site, uh, which is available via the blog. So it's madsideblog.tradoc.army.mil. Uh, Ian Kersey will go ahead and put it in the chat, but that's really our great touch point where you can find out about all the events we're doing. Um, if you subscribe to the blog, you get future reads uh, twice a week. They're usually a thousand-ish words, so quick reads for you. Um, and we're actually going to be having, it's already started, our information, um, uh, or excuse me, our, uh, our vignettes for the weaponization and information. So what does that look like in the future as we deal uh, in this future operational environment with all these different challenges? So again, check out the blog. Um, you can follow us on at Army Mad Sci on Twitter uh, and make sure you subscribe to the blog. So thank you again for everyone. Um, we are having a, a culminating event in 21 July uh, with, again, Georgetown University and the Center for uh, Strategic Studies. But we will be having more online events leading up to that, and we'll be sure to publicize those. So again, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to the blog, and you'll know all about it. Uh, Dr. Kosar, Dr. Paul, thank you so much again for coming on, and we want to thank everybody for being here. Yeah, happy to. Thanks very much. Great questions, great discussion. Glad to be part of it. Thanks, Thanks so much. much.